Hello, welcome everyone to the Microsoft Defender for Endpoint Ninja Show, episode 106. My name is Heike Ritter and I will be your host. So this is the sixth episode and today it's all about alerts and incidents and how you will use these in your investigations. Both entities have rich details and insights and I have a top expert with me, Michael Malone, who will show us all the things you need to know about alerts and incidents. Before I hand over to Michael, um, he is also known as the DHA Hunter and I would love for Michael to explain us a little bit where that comes from. So, Michael? Hey, Heike. So I spent about the past two years on the Microsoft Defender product group, helping get customer feedback into the Defender development teams to make sure we have what everybody needs inside the product. Uh, before that, I spent about seven and a half years doing target attack, incident response and recovery with Microsoft Dart. So you actually you have to be using our tool set to, uh, to track and intercept uh, determine human adversaries inside of customer networks. Wow. Okay. So we hired the right person onto our team, I guess. <laughs> so, Michael, it's again all about alerts and incidents and who could be better than you, um, having done all that work before, explaining to us how they're being used, what are the rich insights and alerts um, can give you, or what is all behind an incident. So why don't you start? Kicking it off? Yeah, so alerts and incidents are kind of at the core of the Defender XDR capability. Uh, an alert by itself is, a, is an individual observation from one of the Microsoft 365 Defender pillars. So it could be Defender for Endpoint, Defender for Identity, Defender for Office, Defender for Cloud Apps. Essentially, it's something that we see that's suspicious or malicious inside the enterprise. Now, by themselves, there could be quite a bit of individual alerts. So we've got this really cool concept called incidents. An incident is an automatically correlated set of alerts that we came across. Um, so in other words, instead of looking at individual entities by themselves, an incident will try and pull together the things that we think are related. So you only have to look at one element of the, of the breach to get the entire picture rather than looking at a whole bunch of isolated incidents. Uh, uh, pardon me, alerts. Can you explain a little bit what the logic behind is? So when will alerts be grouped into an incident? Incidents take individual alerts and they try and group them together based on some sort of a common element. That could be the same device and same time frame, same file hash, same user account, perhaps the same email address. So it's something similar that we say it's pretty likely that this particular individual alert is related to this other alert as a result of one of those elements that, that they share. So if I'm a security analyst and I go through alerts and um, I feel like this alert should also be part of that specific incident because I'm now focusing on that entity incident, can I also add my own alerts or like not my own other alerts? Absolutely. Well, you can actually do both. So you can, you can, if, so if we don't pick something up with our automated correlation, you have the ability to go to the alert and say, add to incident. When you add it to an incident, it'll immediately get grouped together with that, with the other alerts in the incident. Uh, there's also a really cool capability in Defender called custom detection. So you can kind of create your own alerts, if you will. So uh, imagine you're in a scenario where you may have identified something as suspicious or malicious that perhaps we did not. And this could be a, a legitimate tool being used illegitimately, but say in a attackers using a remote administration tool. You can create a custom query in advanced hunting that'll raise an alert, which you can then ultimately get correlated back into these incidents again to help enrich the story. So an alert as well as incidents, they have a risk level. So they have high, low, like <laughs> low, medium, high. How would you um, see these when you as as a security analyst work with alerts like you prioritize the high i guess what's what's behind the categories so individually the alerts are going to have a severity based on what we believe to be the residual risk after the alert fires so if it's something like an if it's something like a malware alert and we clean up the malware typically the severity is going to be lower if we fire an alert and let's say the device is configured to not remediate uh we're the the risk level is going to be higher now that's at the alert level 
Aggregated at the incident level, it's going to show you the most high ranking, uh, the, it's going to carry the same severity as the highest ranking alert inside the incident. So if you're looking at the incident severity, you're essentially looking at this, the, the overall risk that we believe for that particular incident based on the individual alerts within it. Wow. So it's uh, it's kind of a great way to, to help prioritize. If you see a higher ranking uh, incident or alert, I would probably gravitate towards those first if possible. I think another thing that I would like to add here is an awesome capability that we have a, a scenario basically across different Microsoft technologies is um, you can use these risk level for conditional access. So you could say, um, if a device has a high risk level, you will not allow that device to access corporate data anymore. I think this is so huge and some people might not even know about the integration um, with conditional access, right? Absolutely. And that's part of our zero trust story. So for conditional access, you can say if a device has a active alert over a certain severity level, do not grant it access to specific resources or perhaps add another form of authentication on top of it. It's all up to how you configure it, but it's it's all about helping ensure that the devices that are accessing your cloud, ser your cloud services are trustworthy. Would you mind showing us an alert and walk us a little bit through all the details? Um, and I mean, maybe, I don't know, up to you. Either we start with an incident and show the all up incident information and then we drill down into an alert from there? Absolutely, yeah, let's just jump into the portal. So you can find incidents and alerts in the upper left hand portal. So we'll go over here to incidents and alerts and expand it out. You're gonna see we have incidents and we have alerts here. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start out with the incidents in this case. Now, if we click on incidents, and let's go ahead and go a little more than one week here. We'll go to 30 days. You're gonna see we've got one major incident here. It's listed as multi-stage incident involving execution exfiltration. This has got a high severity. So it's something we're probably wanna dig into. Uh, if you expand it out, you'll see the individual alerts that are associated with this particular incident. Now, you can also pop into the alerts page if you wanna see them directly. But we're gonna try and save some time and focus on the incident view, which is probably where your hunters are gonna to wanna to look in the first place. Uh, inside here, each of these are individual alerts that we came across. You can also see where the source was for this particular alert by scrolling over here to the right. This we have some EDR alerts in here, which is gonna be dependent for endpoint, MDI, which is dependent for identity. We also have a Microsoft 365 Defender alert in here. So this is kind of an interesting one. It's essentially part of our XDR story. It means we saw things in more than one pillar of the Defender stack that, that kind of together, like individually, they weren't interesting enough to raise an alert, but when you put the pieces together, it becomes interesting or suspicious. So let's go ahead and scroll over here to the left and to the top. We're gonna go ahead and jump into this incident. So from the incident, the, on the home page, you've got a bunch of good information. You've got how many active alerts, this one has 23. Uh, you've got this little reference for the MITRE ATT&CK framework, which lets you know which pillars we found alerts in. We had seven different MITRE ATT&CK categories in this attack here. So something we definitely want to dig into a little bit further. Uh, down here on the left, you have a, a bit of a timeline, which kind of gives you all the alerts in chronological order to let you see what, uh, essentially how, the, how it manifested. Uh, in the middle, you've got the entities. So this is going to be the devices and the user accounts that we came across that as involved with this incident. So we've got DC1, Machine3, WebServe1, and a couple of different user accounts that are, interest, that are of interest in here. Can I ask you these um, categories, MITRE ATT&CK uh, categories, like how would someone use that? Like wh why, I, I know it's a big thing that it's part of it, but how would you as a security analyst use that information? So the MITRE ATT&CK framework is essentially a categorization of different, different phases of an attack. It, it, it highlights the tactics, techniques, and procedures used by an attacker at different phases. So it starts off on the left-hand side with the early phase things, such as reconnaissance. And as you move towards the right, you're typically later on in the attack. So uh, on the far, farthest right side, you have impact, which is essentially the ultimate goal of whatever the attacker is trying to do, typically. So when you say um, damage, this could be something like data exfiltration, for instance? Absolutely. So data exfiltration is one of the pillars we've got. Uh, impact uh, could be like device encryption or whatnot. There's lateral movement. There's a bunch of different categories. And ultimately, as you move towards the right, they become later, typically later stage in the attack. Okay, thank you so much. So 
what else can we find in the incident summary? The next thing we've got down here is the evidence. So evidence essentially is when we have investigation, this is going to pick up the processes and the files that we saw associated. So while up here, these entities, the devices and users are kind of like your principal focus points, the evidence is where you're going to find uh, evidence of malware, for example, or if you see a file that might be of interest, things that we identify associated with the attack that may not be a potentially compromised asset, it may be an attacker tool or something essentially. And over here to the right, we've got a bunch more information that will let you know, like, for example, the first time, the first activity in this particular incident, the last activity in the incident, uh, classification, determination. So uh, incidents and alerts have a bunch of information in it, too. So you can jump into manage incident and you can essentially mass close or mass classify all the alerts in there by just setting the status and then setting the classification. Classification would be, so for example, let's say we were looking at this and we know this is our, our red team or pen testing. You can flag it as being uh, not malicious in nature. Essentially, it could be uh, informational expected activities like security tests, for example. You can also flag it as being, hey, this is a multi-stage attack. Uh, this essentially helps you categorize this for, for future use. Um, I saw something, yet now I see it again, which is graph. Do we want to talk about that and show the graph of an incident? Absolutely. The graph is probably my favorite thing on incidents. So if we click on graph, you get this really great view of how the, uh, the individual entities we came across and how they interrelate. So if you're looking at a bunch of alerts, it's, it's giving you a story of what happened. But when you look at it through the graph, you're seeing where some of these relationships came from. So right now we've got DC1 and Machine 3 are linked together by the IT Help Desk account. So this becomes a very interesting point. Uh, also, there's some great work here to help make it simplified that you can also break out. So we've got files and processes, but let's say we wanted to see everything. If you uncheck this box up here, it'll give you all the individual findings and where we saw them and if there's, if there's any correlation between them. So is this now a correlation of alerts and evidence mixed together in a, of course, logical way to show the graph? Exactly. Yeah, and it's it's uh, it's really handy. Uh, we've done we've done a pretty good job of of highlighting what I like to call the ABCs of the incident response, which is the authentication methods, backdoors, and communication channels. So. Uh, in these cases, we've got the related entities, DC1, IT Help Desk is our user account. We've got potential backdoors that are out there highlighted out here, like the suspicious, a couple different suspicious services. Really handy for, for getting a, your head around the blast radius of an incident. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Can we dive into an alert? So alerts are kind of at the heart. As I mentioned, these are the individual observations. So there's a lot of really good information hiding inside the alerts. So let's go ahead and jump into one of these alerts. We can jump into these alerts from here. So if you click on one of these, these timelines from the graph, you can also go from the alerts page. There's a number of different ways to jump into them. Uh, if you click on this, you're gonna get the fly out. We're gonna go ahead and just jump straight into the alert page itself. Now, right off the bat, we've got a couple of uh, really important things to note. The first thing is you've got the device of interest and the user of interest. Right now, the device of interest is flagged as high. We've also got a little bit of information here that it's a server 2019 device. These are coming from the tags on the device. Below that, it's bringing us right to the alert in the process tree, but the alert story gives you a really great picture of everything that we have associated with this particular alert. You'll see that we have all the processes and which processes launch which processes within the same context. So the same device, same user account in this case. While we are looking at one specific alert, you're going to notice there's a whole bunch of different alerts here. And the cool thing is, is we're aggregating all of these together so we can kind of tell you more of a holistic story. Rather than looking at a single alert, we're actually looking at everything to help provide context. Now, if we scroll down here, let's take a look at our Swiss WMI uh, activity initiated remotely. So if we click on this, it's going to change the right. Uh, we've got a bunch of information about that particular alert. So the, the attack techniques, we've got this is going to be a WMI detection. Uh, it falls in the execution category. We've also got some, some information about how many, the incident itself and how it's linked together. So this is what we were talking about on in the incidents. There's had the same file in this case, same device, same user credentials. These are different aspects we're able to use to link it together. Now, this alert is sitting below reg.exe. So if we expand this out, you're going to get the information about the reg.exe process. Uh, you, it's got information, once again, about the techniques that were involved, the user, 
the PE metadata. So this is essentially all the metadata about the executable that is used to create this process. So you'll see, for example, the company, the product, the version, all that kind of fun stuff. You'll also notice that we identified that the system hive was referenced in the command line, which is interesting because that's showing us that we're using reg against the system hive, which in and of itself is rather suspicious. And as you can see right up here, what the attacker is doing is saving off the system hive uh, into a folder C Windows temp system hive. This is a great opportunity for an attacker to steal some sensitive information from that box. Before you move on, so you talked about there's a file involved, right? A portable executable. If I want to know more about that portable executable, what it's capable to do, is there a way to give me some more information? So each of these elements here, so the files and such, have a dedicated page, just like the device and the user account. So if we click on open file page, for example, it's gonna take us to that specific file's information. So the file page gives you a bunch of really good information about, in this case, reg.exe. Uh, we've got that file hashes. We've got the fact that it was signed by Microsoft Windows, and it's a legit signed file. You can see this little certificate over here. Uh, you have the issuer information. You've also got details about 13 active alerts and four distinct incidents in the past 180 days. So reg.exe has been used suspiciously a number of times. But interesting enough, the file itself is not malicious. So virus total is telling us that there's zero out of 69 anti-malware engines are detecting this as a malicious file. And we don't detect it as anything specifically down here. You also have some information about the prevalence of the files. So there's not anybody's emails, but there's 632,000 devices worldwide that had this file by its hash. This is huge thing about Microsoft data, the prevalence worldwide, the prevalence in your organization. So you really get a good understanding if not probably reg.exe, but um, if it's a different file, if it's targeted to your organization, if it's something wider. So yeah, thanks. I love it. Prevalence really plays into how customized a file might be for a given organization. If a file is super low prevalence, it kind of becomes a little more suspicious especially if it's executable. If it's something like a, a document file, perhaps if this can be normal because if you change a single character, it's got a different file hash. But if you're seeing executables that have have a very low prevalence, either it's just been reduced or just been released, it's just it maybe it's built in-house, or it could be custom crafted for the specific target organization. This could be a brand new attack. So awesome. Thanks for showing that file page. And um, I think I saw that here where you can actually send this also there is a deep file analysis option. Yeah, the deep analysis is great. Uh, it essentially is like an automated sandboxing where you can, you can click submit and it will request the file from the endpoint and submit it for detonation. Detonation is gonna give you a bunch of information about what activities the file performed under emulation and let you kind of give you an idea of if it might be performing suspicious activities like maybe trying to persist uh, or if there's any other, any sort of, uh, any other generally suspicious activity performed by the file. Yeah, I want to add here, um, and it's like, if we have that file already in our sample store, we will of course use that. And um, we are not just grabbing a file um, from the devices. It's basically the portal will trigger the client to send it up. So it's a communication from the client to our cloud. So. And so the other cool thing is, if you see this file and you believe it's malicious, we have the ability to add an indicator, which will enable you to block that file by hash anywhere in your enterprise. Let's go back to the alert page. I think I, sorry, moved you to the um, file page but let's go back to the alert. Of course. So back to the alert page, uh, we've got a few other things here that are of interest. Typically when you're looking at something like from an alert perspective, you're looking at a suspicious entity and you kind of want to see what's happening before or after it. And we've got this really cool capability called see in timeline. So if we go ahead and click on see in timeline, it'll bring the specific alert up at the exact point in time when it happened on the device's timeline. And the timeline is a really cool way to see what happened just before or just after a suspicious or interesting event. So in this case here, we can dive in, see some information here that service hosts are performing process discovery by invoking WSN prop host. Uh, you can also click on load newer results and see what happened after the fact, but it essentially jumps you right into the, into the timeline, letting you know what happened around that event. So 
perhaps if it's a piece of malware, you might see where it came from. Or if it's attacker activity, you might see the zip file that they may have created of sensitive files inside your organization. So what is that coloring over there? So I can see there's a little, a few items that are gray. <laughs> uh, what's the difference? So yeah, so we're actually highlighting the individual events that are associated with the alert. Uh, there's also, speaking of coloring, there's a couple of other cool things while we're here, such as if there's different alerts on the device, you're going to see little pointers up here for the individual alerts that happened over time. You also have the ability to flag things of interest. So if perhaps you identified something associated with the incident that we did not have an alert for, uh, you have the ability to click on these little flags here. And when you do so, a flag is going to appear on the timeline, wherever that falls in the, in the time frame. So, um, so this is the end entire machine timeline with all the events that we collected from the endpoint to show you the whole history of what happened. The gray lines are basically events that caught our attention to build an alert. And now there is like little things to click on. Uh, what are these bubbles? And what is if you click directly? I think there's so many things you can click on. Show us. Yeah, absolutely. So there's you can you can select the individual rows. When you click on one, it's going to bring you up a uh, a flyout that's going to have the context associated with it. So the process tree that's tied to that particular row. You're going to have essentially the process tree that led up to the the event of interest. You've also got a really cool capability here called hunt for related events. So this is our go hunt capability. So if you click on this, it's going to open up a new tab and bring you straight into advanced hunting with the query designed to bring back results that are relevant to that particular event in that time frame typically. So in this case, we're looking at a particular time frame that the event occurred, and we're searching a whole bunch of different tables to see if anything happened within a 30 minute window of that event on that particular device. So you can either use this one as this and just hit run query, or you can use this as a baseline to create your own query to look for perhaps on different devices or correlate things based on hashes. It gives you a great starting point for, for your advanced hunting experience. Awesome. And I know we will have an episode on advanced hunting. I know that uh, that's basically your topic as well. And I want to point people at that point, um, point people at that point <laughs> to the um, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint Ninja blog, because we have all your recordings from the KQL introduction fundamentals, as well as you did an amazing webinar series, um, Lead Speak, where you go and actually hunt for specific cases. So we will put that, of course in our references for you so you can click and go there awesome yeah definitely check out our series lead speak uh there's also the uh, uh there's tracking the adversary for mtp advanced hunting so if you're if you're serious about advanced hunting that's a great way to get into it it starts at a pretty one-on-one -on -one level and takes you up to some very advanced topics including anomaly detection and we end up with a uh, with that with an actual hunt. It's a we're using Defender to hunt down an incident inside of a portal. Now that you actually showed us um, events and uh, made us aware of this go hunt with like this automated query, let's imagine you know you have a lot of noisy alerts that are maybe you know we think it's malicious suspicious but it's something line of business application that is just as it is and we don't want to be disturbed by these kind of alerts we do our best to try and tune down the false any false positive detections but there are some cases where a maybe your in-house application might generate alert that's illegitimate going back to the alert here we have the ability to manage these alerts so if you go to the ellipsis over here on the alert flyout, and we can do this also from the alerts page. There are a couple different spots you can do this with, uh, but you can create a suppression rule. And the suppression rule will enable you to set conditions when this particular alert should not fire. So you can say, for example, the process or the parent process matches one another conditions. So this is these check marks, by the way. These are ands, if you will. So all four of these have to be true for the suppression rule to take place. In this case, the file name has to be this, the folder path has to be this, the SHA-1 has to be this, and the command line has to be this. So you may need to modify this slightly depending on uh, how you want to tweak and suppress this rule. Down here, you have the ability to either hide it or resolve it. So resolve it keeps it around, hide it makes it, it doesn't even show up to your SIM or anything that might be integrated with the product. It basically hides the alert from everything. 
Uh, you can also set a scope. So let's say there's a specific box that this is happening on. You can set the scope to say only this one particular device, or you can also say alerts in specific device groups and choose device groups inside your enterprise that you expect this alert to false positive on. Last, we're, you have to put in some information about the, the suppression rule name, any comments about it, uh, so that we have the ability to, uh, to suppress it and to, to identify it, pardon me, uh, and save it back. And this will prevent that particular alert from firing in those conditions in the future. And then once you did this, um, it's gone forever. And if I want it back, like, do where do I see my suppression rules that I have configured? Sure. So there's always a way to see what was suppressed. Let's cancel out of here, go to our flyout, and scroll down to settings. Click on endpoints and scroll down. You'll see alert suppression is one of the options. Right now, we don't have any suppression rules to find this particular tenant, but if you had one set up, uh, you'd see the suppression rule listed right here. You can you can see the alerts and that were suppressed by it, and uh, disable the suppression rule if it's if it's too aggressive. Now that I have worked on my alerts, I classified them. Maybe um, I'm done. Like, what do I do with an alert that's resolved? Yeah, absolutely. So there's different ways you can handle this. You can do it at the incident level or at the alert level, depending on what you're looking at. So at the alert level, let's just go ahead and pop into the alerts uh, alerts page here. You can click on these and essentially set the status. Wow, thanks so much, Michael, for walking us through this. Is there anything else that you would like to show our audience when it comes to alerts and incidents? You know, there's a lot of stuff in Defender, uh, and I'm excited to see all the things that are coming in the upcoming Ninja series. Uh, we've got, the, like, there's the ability to submit to threat experts and such. I'm going to be watching those episodes myself to see uh, see uh, how the deep, deep dive in the product. That's actually a good point. And the next episode is episode seven, and we will talk about automation. And, um, of course, we will go back to incidents in automation and alerts to see how um, our automated investigation and response looks at alerts and resolves those automatically for us. Um, but for now, Michael, thank you so much for being part of the show, for being my guest for this special episode around alerts and incidents. Absolutely. It's been it was... great on, on the show. Thank you for having me. And I'm pretty sure that I will ask you again to join me as a guest for an upcoming episode. And with that, I want to thank the audience for watching. Thank you for being an amazing audience and come back for the next show, which is again, episode seven about automated investigation and response. Thank you, Johaike.